Oh man, can you guys feel that? You can feel it in the air, like static electricity, or that moment right before the first snowflake hits you and melts on your face. It's that feeling of transition and change, when you know that everything old is on the way out and something new is coming. We've just lived through an era when mega cap tech companies seem to rule everything. Their founders were among the richest people on earth, they had the most sought after jobs. They even garnered so much power that they got to decide what we were allowed to talk about. But they got too rich and too soft. They wore the crown for too long. Too much avocado toast and too many pumpkin spice vegan frappuccinos. Now is the beginning of one of those eras when pawns will rise to be kings. And those new kings, they might all live in crypto. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss how the mighty have fallen, the big dive that Meta just took, why Elizabeth Warren and AOC are very angry at crypto, at least why they're very angry at crypto this time around. Elon Musk and his entrance into Twitter HQ, a new version of NAMI, people paying for telemedicine on Cardano, A16Z taking a painful hit, and new regulatory proposals out of Singapore. If your first reaction upon seeing this image was, hey bro, listen, pawns don't have crowns. It's just a pawn. There's no crown. I know. This pawn is special, just like crypto. Or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Oh man, guys, look at this. Meta is down over 60% year to date. Don't worry, I'm not going to start drawing Fibonacci's or anything like that. Just showing you how crazy things are right now for Meta. If you think that's crazy, Look at the after hours trading just from today. They're down 20%, <laughs> down 19.66% just in the after hours trading today, just over the course of a couple of hours, 20%. At the height of the powers of the old nobles, it always looks like it would be impossible to usurp the king. But when they're losing 20%, in a matter of a couple hours, all of a sudden, anything becomes possible. So we need to look at why Meta has has suffered this gigantic nosedive. And, you know, of course, there's there may be, you know, a giant rebound tomorrow. The markets are crazy. But this is a sign of changing times. This is the lowest Meta's price has been in a long time. I believe this signals the start, at least... This, this is a flag that shows us that a new era might be beginning right now. So we have to ask, why did this happen? Could it be this? Meta has repurchased $42 billion of stock in the past 12 months. So they have, they have bought back $42 billion worth of stock in the last year, according to this post, at an average price of $300, is now trading at $112. That's an interesting observation. Probably not it. I think that's probably not it. Was it this? Was it because this video went hilariously viral day in the life as a product manager at Meta, a 23-year-old project manager at Meta? You got to look at yourself in the mirror, take some selfies with your phone, play with your hair a little bit. Then you got to do some journaling. Your journal contains things like this, work, workout, and vibe, a lot of affirmations, a lot of manifestations, a lot of gratitude for things like your boyfriend. Then after your journaling, you do your, the workout part of work, workout and vibe. Then you get dressed. And most important thing about getting dressed is try to look cute every day. Then you go to work and you have a nice leisurely meal, some fruit, some toast. Oh, got to have pumpkin spice vegan latte at the office. It's the next order of business. Make yourself that pumpkin spice vegan latte or frappuccino, probably a frappuccino. Then acknowledge that every single morning, that's what you really need. Not to actually work at work, but to have your frappuccino. 
then go up to the roof and possibly do some work, possibly do some work, but really it's more like more selfie time. There you go. You got maybe a drone shot or someone from another rooftop. It's really about the photo opportunity, not doing the actual project management you're supposed to be doing. Again, most important thing, being cute, being cute. Snack time. Then you got to shuttle home, drink some wine with your friends, wait for your boyfriend to come over so that he can DJ for your dog. So was it this? Was it the avocado toast era of tech companies? Was it the culture? Did they become too soft? Did the tech companies become too soft? I mean, a lot of them have these, these stories of their founding where they started in somebody's garage and there were just a couple of people and they created some product that would change the world. I think at this point, we can definitely say that a lot of these, these platforms changed the world. Did they grow too bloated, too bureaucratic? Did they eat too much avocado toast? Did they hire too many people like this who aren't really working? Is, is that why they've reached this point? I do like to think that the all of the avocado toast and the vegan frappuccinos and hiring the wrong people for absolutely the wrong reasons, that's probably part of it. But I think the bigger thing is just this. They got too big. This post says the Meta Metaverse Division Reality Labs lost $3.7 billion this quarter. That's just this quarter. That's not for the entire period year to date, that number is much larger. That's just this quarter. That's how much money they lost. Zuckerberg lost that much money trying to build out his metaverse. And what have they produced so far? Well, the results have been mainly panned. People mainly make fun of the metaverse being produced by Meta, which is pretty bad since their name is Meta. Why how can they spend so much money and not have a, a metaverse product already that blows everybody away? It's because they've lost that nimbleness. They're no longer a few people in a garage. They're now a gigantic, bloated, bureaucratic organization, hiring all the wrong people, paying for people to hang out on roofs all day and take pictures of themselves along with their avocado toast. That's what they become. They're no longer the nimble, innovative company that was founded so long ago. They've grown into these colossal dollar wasting organizations. And they've been so profitable because of the gigantic platforms that were built so long ago and developed into these giant things. They, they were making so much money for so long. I think it's hard for them to realize that sometimes when you waste money, it's just wasted. It doesn't really come back to you. If we took $3.7 billion and even if we took a tenth of that and split it up with all the Cardano metaverses, they would probably provide, every single one of them would probably provide a better user experience than Meta has been able to provide in their metaverse so far. Certainly, it would be less made fun of universally by everyone. This is just a great example of a larger theme I think we're going to see over and over again. I think whatever comes out of the Reality Labs division of Meta in terms of an actual metaverse over the next year, two years, five years, it's probably going to end up being great. It'll, they'll probably, they've got so much money and they're spending so much money and there's so much talent, they're probably going to make something great. The problem is for a tiny sliver of the amount of money they spend, there are going to be metaverse projects in crypto that are an equal or better experience for the users. The users are going to enjoy the experience in the crypto metaverses probably more, but maybe equally at a fraction of the cost. This is a problem. Crypto is going to outcompete the tech platforms at providing the experiences that people want to have digitally over the next 10 years. The big tech platforms, they can buy all the talent in the world. They can probably create whatever we create in crypto. They can also create that thing, but we're going to be able to do it at a fraction of the price and users are going to like it better because it's not them. People don't want to be in the Facebook metaverse.
they're going to naturally prefer the crypto metaverse anyways. And we're going to be able to create that experience at a fraction of the price. We're just going to start out competing the big tech platforms in a lot of different things. This is just the beginning. So why is it that we're going to outcompete them? I've already said that they're too bloated and bureaucratic. They're just too big. They've hired the wrong people. The culture is too much avocado toast, all those things. But it's also that when they build a new product, they have to build it to scale. Their internal demands are such that they must build it to scale to their current user base. They're at least maybe not their entire current user base, but they're gonna they're going to build it so that it can scale to a gigantic level, which is a good thing. You always want products to be scalable. However, they're gonna make sacrifices. They're gonna make sacrifices in terms of user experience in order to achieve the scale that'll be satisfying internally to them, to their investors, their board of directors, all those things. Whereas in crypto, all the same experiences. We're going to build them user experience first and then figure out how to scale them later. And those will be two lines on a graph that will intersect each other. There will be a point where the better user experience scales and scales and scales because it's a better user experience. People want it more. We'll figure out how to scale it. And it's actually going to surpass the inferior user experience that was built to scale having already sacrificed the user experience. Let's face it, you could slap a sticker on almost anything that says not made by lizard persons. And just for that reason alone, just people having seen that sticker, it's going to be a better user experience than anything made by Meta, Google, Apple, or Amazon. Unfortunately, the lizard tech people are not going to give up their crowns without a fight. May I present to you a letter written to Gary Gensler chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission from our favorite Congress people, Elizabeth Warren, AOC, Sheldon Whitehouse, Jesus Garcia, and Rashida, Rashida Tlaib. And what does this letter say? Well, according to the Tech Transparency Project, over 200 government officials have moved between public service and crypto firms serving as advisors, board members, investors, lobbyists, legal counsel, or in-house executives. And then they go through and start naming what departments all these people came from. There is a revolving door in every single regulatory body in Washington. Why? because when you work for one of those regulatory bodies, you develop certain skills and knowledge about United States regulations of the regulation of that industry. You understand the regulator and the regulations better than anybody in the industry because you were the regulator. So of course, industry wants to hire those former regulators to help them to comply with all the regulations and laws. This is a pretty normal thing. It can seem a little bit sketchy when someone is, you know, regulating a certain company and then the next month they pop up and they're working for that company. Cause you have to ask yourself the question, did they know that they were going to go to work for that company? Maybe did they go a little lighter on that company than they should have? because they didn't want to make them mad because they knew they were probably going to try to work for them after they got done working for the government? Of course, you ask that question. But the fact of the matter is, we have former regulators going to work for every single industry that's being regulated. The revolving door is definitely a thing in Washington. The interesting thing here is they're not interested in the revolving door in general. They're just interested in the revolving door as it relates to crypto. So if this all helps an industry better comply with the regulations that it's supposed to be complying with, why are these particular Congress people so concerned about this? Well, they tell you right here. They tell you that all these regulators are current, these former regulators are currently advising or lobbying for crypto interests. Amid this hiring spree, crypto firms more than quadrupled their lobbying spending over the last three years. Indeed, hiring former regulators and government officials provides the crypto industry with a sense of legitimacy. That's the problem. Crypto is now doing more effective lobbying. They even compare it to Wall Street. Just as powerful Wall Street interests have long exercised their influence over financial regulation by hiring former officials with knowledge of the government's inner workings, oh no, 
oh no, it would be so terrible if crypto had some sense of legitimacy and had people working for it with the same knowledge that Wall Street has of government's inner workings. Apparently, these would be terrible things because these are the things they're citing in their letter that they don't like. They really don't like that crypto has gotten apparently four times as good at lobbying. At least we have four times as much lobbying going on. According to this letter, there's four times as much lobbying spending. The reason why they don't like that is because they want to go after these these Congress people, they probably want to do certain things. They want to go after crypto. And if crypto is doing effective lobbying, just like Wall Street is, then when they go to their fellow Congress people's offices to try to get them to go along with whatever they want to do to crypto, those people are going to say, actually, we like crypto. We know about crypto. We've learned about crypto now. We actually like crypto. We aren't going to go along with a regulatory scheme that prevents the United States from being a part of the global race to embrace crypto. We don't want the US to be crippled in that race. We don't want all of these crypto companies to go offshore and leave the United States behind. So what does this have to do with the big tech companies? Well, if we look at AOC's top campaign contributors, we see Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta, they're all among her top donors. Elizabeth Warren, number three is Alphabet. Rashida Tlaib, top contributor, Apple. The interests of those companies are very tied up in Web2. They are the kings of Web2. They are not friends of Web3 and crypto. <laughs> they are not hoping that Bitcoin and Ethereum and Cardano do great next year. They're hoping Web2 does great next year because that's their business. You notice they're not complaining in this letter about the big tech companies hiring a lot of former government employees. And I can guarantee you they are. They're hiring a lot of government employees for the exact same reasons that crypto is. But these Congress people, they're not concerned about that. They're only concerned about crypto hiring those kinds of people. Speaking of tech companies, latest reports are that Elon is going to close on the Twitter deal maybe this Friday. We've already talked about the possible ramifications of that. If he's buying Twitter partially because of its potential as a payments network, he could just incorporate whatever cryptos he wants to directly into Twitter, and that could be a thing. But it looks like he actually went to the Twitter headquarters today and posted this pretty amusing video. He literally walked in the door of Twitter headquarters carrying an actual sink, a literal physical sink. You can see it right here in the video. And the, po the uh, caption was, entering Twitter headquarters, let that sink in. Obviously, a lot of the employees of Twitter they fall on the opposite side of the political spectrum from Elon Musk, and they are not happy. They're not happy about him owning Twitter, him controlling Twitter with his uh, his his ownership in the company. So I think he's uh, just letting them know right now, yes, that future is about to happen. Back in the land of Cardano, we now have version 3.4.1 of Nami Wallet out. And Alessandro says, just published hard, I think this is HW support. I think this is hardware, hardware wallet support, hardware wallet support for Vassal. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think this is hardware wallet support for Vassal, Vassal which I love, along with SIP67 and SIP68 support. He says, time to drive adoption for these exciting times ahead. I think uh, NAMI users will be excited about this. If you follow this channel, you probably know that the one thing I really love in Cardano and in crypto in general, but especially in Cardano, is real world use cases. Here we have a post from Citaldoc. Citaldoc. We are getting emotional right now. First ADA transaction in our telemedicine platform. Check this out. They have a screenshot of apparently an actual telemedicine transaction on the Cardano blockchain. Looks like paid for, paid for in ADA. Is that right? I get excited about stuff like this. I think the piece that drew a lot of us into crypto was the idea that we could build out a whole economic system. This is exciting to me. I hope we see a whole lot more of this. 
I hope we see a lot of telemedicine being paid for on this platform and a whole lot of use cases just like this one. I want to see that day when crypto and probably I think it's going to be ADA is used as a real economic system in the real world. Today, you may have noticed that this particular financial newspaper really wanted us to know that Andreessen Horowitz went all in on crypto at the worst possible time. And they made a really big deal about how the uh, latest crypto fund from A16Z suffered a 40% markdown in the first half of this year. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can imagine that probably makes A16Z not very happy. They're probably not very pleased with that because probably their investors in that fund are not pleased with a 40% markdown. <laughs> this this shouldn't really have been a surprise to anyone. I mean, we're in a bear market. This is what happens in a bear market. And it looks like uh Chris Dixon, the partner who was in charge of this particular fund, apparently, he says they have a very long, long-term horizon. I'm I'm sure that's exactly what you should tell investors in this case because he's probably getting a lot of heat. If he's the guy in charge of this fund, he's probably getting a lot of heat from those investors in this fund. But this is this is crypto winter, and this is going to happen to any fund that's invested widely enough in crypto. I'm not exactly sure why, the, why this particular newspaper wanted us to to know about this. It seemed like they really pushed the story. Um, probably probably they just love to see when somebody who ventured off into crypto suffered for it. But of course, on our part in, in crypto proper, we're also probably not all crying our eyes out because a gigantic VC firm is suffering along with us. I said that crypto will probably be able to outcompete big tech companies in a lot of use cases because we're more nimble. I think the same thing is true of governments. More nimble governments will be able to outcompete the bigger, bloated, more bureaucratic, large governments. So one government that seems very nimble is Singapore. We've talked about the monetary authority of Singapore many times. Here, they're laying out some ideas on crypto regulation. They want to enhance standards in cryptocurrency trading and also in stable coins. So of course, like every government, they seem to have their own euphemisms for crypto. They can't just call it crypto or cryptocurrencies. They have to come up with some crazy euphemistic acronym. In the West, it's often DLT, Digital Ledger Technology. In Singapore, they call them DPT, which sounds like a website you're not supposed to visit when you're like a 13-year-old boy. But in this case, it actually means digital payment tokens. And they say, if you, if you are a service provider in that business, you will be required to provide relevant risk disclosures. So this is something we have a lot of in our securities regulations. We have risk disclosures to do exactly what Singapore is suggesting here, enable retail consumers to make informed decisions. You want them to understand what risks are involved in their acquisition of these assets. This makes sense. They say they also want the these DPT service providers to implement proper segregation of customer assets. This might be a problem for account balance type blockchains because what they often use are these giant slush funds you can think of a lot of the AMMs. What happens? Your funds go into this big sort of slush fund and they're all fungible. They're all commingling. And that is the opposite of what Singapore wants. They want proper segregation. You know who can probably do that a lot better? A UTXO blockchain like Cardano. Cardano is an EUTXO blockchain. We can probably do segregation a lot better than account balance world blockchains can. Of course, Singapore is like every other government in the world. They want to issue CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. So what is a huge area of focus for them? Stable coins. They want to regulate stable coins like crazy so that they can clear the field for their CBDCs. And they have their own euphemistic acronym for stable coins here. SCSs. It's an SCS, not a stable coin. That's if it's pegged to a single currency. It's a single currency stable coin. And they say if there are more than 5 million of them in circulation, 
then you must hold reserve assets in cash, cash equivalents, or short dated sovereign debt securities. They're at least equivalent to 100% of the par value of the outstanding SCS in circulation. This is going to be something that a lot of stable coins will struggle to meet. Some of them, no, but others of them, they will struggle. Some of them won't have a problem, but others of them will have a hard time trying to prove that they can meet the standard for sure. They also say SCS issuers must meet a base capital requirement of the higher of 1 million or 50% of annual operating expenses. So one of the great things about a nimble government like Singapore is they can lay out ideas like this and use this as a foundation to work toward the fine grain regulations that they can actually enact. They can actually promulgate the real regulations. They can move forward from here and actually get to real regulations because they're nimble. I think a lot of the West, the big governments, the West can probably take a note out of the Singaporean book on this one. I hope we do the same. I hope we all agree on some broad ideas and we just move forward and eventually arrive at regulatory clarity. Because if we don't, the West will get left behind by more nimble jurisdictions like Singapore. I hope you're having a great week and I'll talk to you tomorrow.